Well, good evening and welcome to the ACL update. This is a new initiative. We're just trying it. We'll see how it goes and we'd love your feedback. You can always email us. You can jump onto Facebook. Uh, you can message us on our website as well. But as we progress with this new initiative, please let us know how we're going. We're calling it the news update or the ACL update uh, because every Wednesday or every Tuesday, we'll see how we go. We want to bring you an update on the latest that's going on in the ACL, particularly uh, in the political domain. We are so grateful for a supporter base now well over 200,000. And we know that from time to time it's, it's, um, we get messages and it's hard for you to stay up to date with everything that is going on. So this is roughly a half an hour a week program, Tuesdays or Wednesdays, we'll see how we land that to keep you informed of everything that's going on as best as we can. Because we're aware we have a lot of internal meetings, we talk a lot amongst ourselves, but not all of that comes out. So this is an opportunity to connect better with you and to let you know of all that's uh, going on. I'm not alone, my name's Alistair Cameron and I'm the National Director for Growth, but I'm also joined uh, by Wendy Francis, our National Director for Politics. Hi, Wendy. Hey, Alistair, it's um, fun to start this with you. I'm really excited. Excellent. So, Wendy, you were our State Director for Queensland for a long time, and you might have even done things before that, but you've now taken over the politics portfolio. Just give us a quick sense of what that's all about. Yeah, so anybody who knows me from ACL, and I've been with ACL over a decade now, so um, I... I have been State Director for Queensland, also Director of Northern Territory, and I've moved into this national position, which is more an oversight of federal politics. Um, and it also has given me just a bit of a, a seat at the table to just discuss some of the campaigns that we're running. We have run so many campaigns over the years, and, and as you said, we wouldn't be able to do it with the supporters, and so I just want to add my thanks to them because they have been part of so many political campaigns that I've been involved in over the years. Indeed, and the fact that we have grown and continue to grow in terms of our supporter numbers and in terms of our influence, it's very much because people, average Aussies, are engaging in the political issues of the day uh, and making, uh, making a tremendous difference. Uh, now, let's have a look at that federal political picture. There's been a lot going on. In fact, there's been so much going on both at state and federal level that we had a bit of a glitch on our website where the front page was listing so many campaigns that it was sort of getting in the way of other texts on the page. What a tremendously good problem to have that there's so many things going on around the country that we just can't list them all uh, properly. But how about we start with religious discrimination, Wendy? That's been the big issue for us uh, really for most of the last year. Uh, it, it, it began with that that whole issue around Israel Folau, which of course uh, was such a, a big deal for such a period of time. But could you just walk us into what is, what is the current situation with religious discrimination in Australia? So I'll take you back a little bit further than that because it really began when Australia legalised marriage um, as different than what God ordains marriage to be, and that is one man, one woman for life. And so when we changed the rules and changed the laws around marriage, that's when our religious people in our nation started to really need some sort of protection. And that was, uh, we had a Ruddick review uh, and, and both sides of the political divide agreed that there was a need for religious discrimination legislation. And so going into the last election, our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, promised that there would be religious discrimination legislation that would come in his term, this term of government, was he successful. And so we've been waiting a long time for this in this term of government. And, and finally this week, a bill has been tabled. So we have the bill. Whether or not it will get through in this term of parliament is still yet to be seen because it's got to get through the lower house and then the upper house. And so we've still got a way to go. The bill, um, I'd have to say, I think underwhelming is, is a decent word to use for it, but it is a start yep. and we're grateful for that. Okay, so uh, it's taken a while to get here. Perhaps give us an, just a bit of a, a, a run through. What are the basic reforms that the bill does propose? We acknowledge that it's not everything that we wanted. It's not everything that a lot of Christians have hoped for, but you said it's better than nothing. It's a start. What are some of the points? So it provides a protection for people of faith against discrimination in the provision of education, accommodation, um, finance, and there's club memberships. I have to say that really we don't have a huge problem in those areas in Australia at the moment, but it does close the gap on some of the um, state 
discrimination laws, particularly in New South Wales and South Australia. So there's that. Um, statement of faith protections have been extended to uh, qualifying bodies such as medical, uh, teaching, regulate, registration authorities. Um, health practitioners and teachers have been um, investigated. We know that. And this is our HRLA, so our Human Rights Law Alliance has been involved in a number of cases yep. where teachers and medical uh, practitioners have needed help. And so that's a really good thing. Um, the ability for faith-based schools to prefer uh, to, prefer to employ faith-based staff is in there. We don't think that it goes far enough, particularly when you think of uh, Victoria. And and it would be really good actually to hear from our Victorian director at the moment, our Victorian coordinator, because she is uh, right in the thick of that. And so this bill does not really provide good protections, enough protections, but it's again, it's a start. Yeah. Well, look, uh, thank you, Wendy, for that. Let's bring in Jasmine Ewan. Jasmine, you are our state coordinator in Victoria. You've been doing a lot of work in this area. Just give us a sense for what is it like on the ground in Victoria in regards to religious discrimination right now? Um, well, it's very concerning. It's um, not only the religious exceptions bill that is coming. We all know that the, conver the conversion legislation has been passed early this year. So you see that um, one after another, anti-religions, bill and legislation is coming and of course the latest one is this um, religious exceptions bill which is going to remove the right of not only religious school but also um, um, organizations from hiring staff um, who don't even agree with their belief system or even hire staff who are not even um, part of that um, uh, religious community. So it is really concerning, not only concerning for the Christian community, but also um, for the uh, Muslim community, the Jewish community and other faith community as well. But now folks watching this, they may say, but hang on, um, what, what other organisations are allowed to pick and choose like that? What, what other organisations are allowed to discriminate? Why does the church or why do Christian or religious organisations have, have that unique permission? Is that unique permission or is that something that's actually common right now? It is very common. Um, in fact, in the whole Equal Opportunity Act 2010, you could see there is a long list of what we call is the positive discriminations or we call it also exceptions or exemptions. Basically, this is a basic human rights. For example, um, political parties. They have all the right um, that is, um, you know, allowing them to choose and pick um, what staff that they can employ and what um, people, um, person can come in to become their um, um, members. Um, so clubs as well. Clubs, for example, men's club. It is, um, you know, common sense that you don't allow women to come into men's club. So these are kind of the basic and pretty common uh, protection that is given to um, political parties and clubs and all this. But you are right by saying that why? Why Christian school? Why religious organizations? Why are these religious bodies can't have the same right? Um, why has it been taken now away from them while the political parties and the clubs can retain those kind of protection? You are right by saying that is therefore is very concerning. So rather than a sort of a, prevent, a preventive measure, uh, it's almost an attacking position to sort of discriminate against uh, schools, Christian schools, or, or beyond just Christians, but religious institutions generally. Yes. Okay. So in Victoria, Jasmine, are we up? Are we in a situation where it's past the upper house? It's waiting for the lower house, or the other way around? Yes, it's the other way around. So um, last okay. week on Thursday, um, the bill was passed in the lower house. Um, uh, is um, by 53 and 22. So it's really um, grateful that um, the LNP um, Liberal National Parties they oppose the bill. So next Good. week. It will go to the upper house. Next week will be the very last week, sitting week for the whole year in Victoria. So really have to pray about that. But at the same time, as you know, the pandemic bill is, you know, in a very heating position as well. Um, so it will be three days of sitting weeks. We don't know whether um, there will be time for the religious exceptions bill to be debated. I heard that it might not be um, debated. Not sure. 
But of course, if there is a time left、um, in the upper house, I'm sure they are going to bring up this bill and debate it and even vote on it. Okay. All right. Look, there's always so much going on in Victoria. Jasmine, Yuen, thank you so much for your time today. Much appreciated. Wendy,、um, that's Victoria.、Um, we can see that there are gaps. There, there are areas where we're just、uh, we're just not happy, and there's such an obvious situation in Victoria. And it seems to be that we keep coming back to Victoria. Back to the federal religious discrimination bill. There are some items in there which you feel are.、Um, Uh, are missing, I suppose, areas which are not simply addressed. Just give us a bit of a, an outline as to those areas. And it is—it's disappointing because the first two drafts that we had、um, an opportunity to look at had some of these in them. But we know that there's pushback not only from the ALP and the Greens and and some of the independents, but there's pushback even within the coalition as well on some of these things, which is disappointing.、Right. But、um, the we. The, some of the flashpoints, I think, that people of faith have been looking for protection for、um, the overreach of employers into employees' private speech, commonly called the flower clause. And、mm-hmm. in one way, I wish we didn't call it the flower clause because I think there's been a lot of、um, stuff that's gone along with the with the name flower, which confuses some people. But basically, you know, we don't. Employers don't in, own employees. You know they're not slaves, so their private、uh, lives should be able to. They should be able to give their you know freedom of speech there.、Um, the misuse of hate speech laws、um, against religious expression that that's not being covered. There's still threats to churches and families from、um, the. Conversion laws, so-called conversion laws, particularly that they ban prayer and counselling,、uh, and they actually penalise people for prayer and counselling. That again has come out of Victoria, but these、Absolutely. laws don't don't help that. And then there's、um, obviously again we go back to what Jasmine was just saying: this attack on Christian schools, particularly. There is、uh, a limited、um, potential. Uh, override of state-based laws in this bill, the federal bill, but it doesn't go anywhere near far enough. Right. Yeah. And as you said, there is actually pushback from a number of parliamentarians、uh, on both sides, and that is that is unfortunate. That's troubling. Are we seeing that happening a lot lately? Is it normal for、uh, conservatives or those in in liberal and and other、uh, Conservative circles on the political right、uh, to, to to oppose this、uh, these sort of religious reforms. I think what we're seeing is、um, parliamentarians who are in a what they see as more of a progressive electorate. In order to be re-elected, they are just folding on some of the basic principles that conservative governments actually stand by. And so, when the prime minister comes out with something that is、uh, more aligned to traditional conservative values, we're seeing pushback from some of the more moderate or modern liberals. They're called,、uh, and so we are seeing disunity. But on this bill, I think the what the attorney general has done has really tr- she's really tried very hard to bring her party along with her,、yes. and I'm feeling as if there, you know, there's. Fairly good acceptance of what she's done, but this is why they've had to go to sort of a lowest common denominator in a way because they need to be, they need to try and pull everybody with them. Right. Okay. So let's conclude this point by saying that we we have at the beginnings of something that we can accept.、Uh, we would have liked a lot more.、Uh, we'll give it a tick, but with a number of caveats and considerations. I think you're absolutely right, and it is. We're glad that there is a religious discrimination bill finally being brought before Parliament, but there、mm-hmm. is a long way to go to offer true support for people of faith. So you、uh, you won't be leaving the、uh, Governor General's office、uh, at peace any time soon. No, the、okay. Attorney General's <laughs> office. No. <laughs> oh, sorry, Attorney. What did I say? Attorney、yeah. General. Very、you、good. Attorney、okay. General, but maybe I should take it that far. No,、yeah. no, no, no. Attorney General's <laughs> enough. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. All right, Wendy.、Um, we recently asked our supporters to do something a little bit different,、uh, and、mm-hmm. that was to contact One Nation and ask them to support a disallowance motion、uh, for a charities regulation that the government has introduced. So,、uh, for a lot of our folk, we'll, we'll be sort of struggling to keep up on this one. What's that all about?、Um, how's it progressing? Just a, just an update on that. 
Yeah, it's good. So the government uh, proposed an amendment to the Australian Charities uh, Regulations, and it was it's called Governance Standard 3. But what they did is that they expanded the reasons why a charity can actually be deregistered. They did this, uh, the reasons they did this was to really catch up on um, some charities that are charity by name and they get tax benefit for that. But what they're doing is breaking into farms and pouring out milk and and doing some really dastardly things. And so that was the reason behind what they were doing. But what they did, in effect, was that they lowered the bar so low that they're going to catch churches and certainly they would catch um, organisations. We've got from Meals on Wheels right up to the Salvos are all saying this is just a really bad regulation because even... So for, I'll give an example for... Um, a charity that it would be close to our heart and that yep. would be a pro-life charity. So if mm -hmm. a pro-life charity had a, a march and they were holding up a sign that somehow triggered somebody who had had an abortion, let's say. So the sign might be um, just a really lovely sign. It, it might not have anything at all that we would think would be vilifying, but a pro-life sign might trigger somebody that person could make a complaint, and on the basis of that complaint, it is possible for that charity to be deregistered. So the bar has been um, taken very low. Even if, if we put out advertising for a, a forum or a, a seminar on gender, and, and in, right. that, in that um, advertising we said we're going to talk about girls are girls and boys are boys, um, that could actually trigger a, a loss of charitable status. So it's kind of this whole woke thing again, encroaching on charities regulation. It really is. And, and it's unfortunate because I don't believe that that's where the government was going with it. What but do you think they has, wanted to do? Well, I really think they just wanted to clamp down. There are a lot of charities out there who, who um, they... They're just there for mischief purposes, to be honest. Right, there are right. some charities. So they're wanting to clamp down on them. And I don't think that they, uh, they anticipated the pushback from particularly charities of, of faith. But also we've got, you know, as I say, Meals on Wheels right up to the Salvos who are really okay. concerned about this. So what are we doing as the ACL and what are we, uh, uh, how are we progressing this? So the key votes were really uh, the Hanson, Pauline Hanson's party, One Nation. And so mm -hmm. that's why we asked our people to go to her party. Now, we have had news this week that she has successfully gotten the government to change some of this regulation. And it was reported in the paper. And in the paper, she said that the she had had a long talk with the Australian Christian Lobby, which was it was encouraging for us to know that there is a, a knock-on effect from our supporters. We call on our supporters, please let uh, the One Nation Party know that we need to act on this. Mm -hmm. Our supporters respond and in like, I get an opportunity to go and sit with someone like Pauline Hanson. I sat in her office, I just explained to her the problem and then she's gone to the government and then we've got some changes happening. We haven't seen those changes yet so I'm waiting to see them to see whether they've gone far enough but it's really encouraging and, again, people power. All right, so we'll wait and see on the government coming back to us with some revised wording for legislation off yeah. the back of the, uh, of the work that One Nation have done. We're very grateful to them for taking up this issue. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Wendy, uh, you uh, have also been working in another area. Actually, for, for as long as you've been with the ACL, you have been working uh, on the welfare issues, various issues regarding the welfare of children and mothers and families, and particularly lately on the protection of our children's innocence. In fact, that's the name of a government report uh, regarding access to pornography online. Now, you've had some further meetings. Uh, give us an update on how that's going. Yeah, because the government um, are moving towards making it impossible well tightening up the regulations for children to get on social media platforms. So they're really doing a lot in that area because they realise the harm that that can be brought to children being on social media too young. Yeah. But what they're not, they still haven't done is introduce the age verification laws that were recommended in this report. So protecting the age of innocence report was tabled uh, in January or February last year. 
Uh, so it's almost been two years since it's come out and we still don't have any movement on this. And at the same time, there's um, Menzies' report, and I'm just reading from their report here. They say that the first exposure to pornography now typically occurs between the ages of 8 and 10, often by accident. 44% of Australian children aged 16, under 16 um, encountered sexual images last month. We've got um, children spending four or more hours a day on their devices, and that has doubled during COVID. And that, understandably, we can understand why. But the number of the percentage of children spending over four hours on their devices during COVID rose from 21% to 44%. And parents are understandably worried. You know, in this report from Menzies, four out of five parents said that they were more concerned about the safety of their children if they were left unsupervised online than unsupervised in a local playground. Wow. So, yeah, there is a big concern. The government does have a way that they can actually make it safer for our children. Um, mm -hmm. And so we are engaged in that conversation. And as you say, children and, and, um, and women have been on my heart for many years. Obviously, I'm a woman, so that, that fits. But I'm also a grandmother. I have 11 yes. grandchildren. And so they are really important uh, to me. And not only them, but every child that they represent. 44%, I mean, that's nearly one in two Australian children encountering sexually explicit content in the last month, in any given month, I presume is what that means. Uh, so that really does mean that it's a crisis. And is it fair to say, Wendy, that one of our concerns is that over the COVID period, we've worked out how to get people to check into buildings using various different authentication and verification measures and so forth. The government uh, can take the lead from France or other governments that have done it. So it's not saying this can't be done. Is it, is it just a lack of political will at this point? Well, the government has put it onto the e-safety commissioner and it just seems to be taking a really long time. I do think it's, it's complicated, but it's not so complicated that it can't be done. It's done in other areas. So if you think of um, gambling, it's not easy for a child to go online and actually gamble away their parents' um, money because they've got to prove that they're an age by having a proof of license or something. They can get around it, and I know that they can, but it's not something that they stumble into. It's got to be a, a, a child who is canny enough to work out how they're going to do it. So they've got to have their parents' license. They've got to have their parents' credit card. There's a whole lot of things they've got to do to be able to gamble. Not so with pornography. All it takes is one click and you're right there. And yep. often it's not even a click straight onto a pornography website. It's a click from an advertisement on the side of a child's game or it's a click from something within the child's game. These, these people who are, um, who are putting out the pornography, these, these websites, they are predators and they want to get hold of our children. And so they go looking yes. for them from a young age. Well, I mean, that is the responsibility of the e-safety commissioner, is it not? Correct. To really be, so, able to be on top of all of that. Absolutely. And I know that mm. the will is there, but it just doesn't seem as if they can actually make it happen. And so we're, we're right in there really pushing hard because when something um, needs to happen quickly, it seems as if we can do it. And we've shown, as you said, we've shown during COVID, we can do these amazing digital things. Um, but when it comes to protecting our children from pornography, we just continually lag behind. And it's becoming not just a crisis, it's becoming an epidemic within our children. Right, so watch this space. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's stay with children. Uh, about a month ago, we combined with a number of other churches and Christian organisations uh, around the Christians United for Afghanistan campaign. And it's not something that we've done very often, but it was a wonderful thing to see such a breadth of unity expressed among Christian groups, uh, irrespective of political persuasion or the focus of the organization or the charity. Uh, a lot of very disparate groups came together there. Um, Wendy, give us a, a bit of an update on, on how that has progressed. So we've done this before, and many of the people who have been supporting ACL for some time will remember back in 2015 when there was a desperate situation for refugees from Syria, and Australia um, opened their doors, and we're encouraging our government to do this once again because we have desperate families needing to get out of Afghanistan for their own safety. 
And often it is children and women who are in the worst situations. And so we're calling our gov- on our government to open the doors and take on 20,000 extra refugees over and above the normal number that we would bring in. Now, at the moment, our government has said we will bring in a certain number, and it was 3,000. I think they're creeping up because they're saying this is a base number. It's not the top. It's the base, and they will do all that they can. But it is, again, something that... Um, the people of Australia need to call on our governments to be to be generous, to be welcoming, to protect and even reunite some of these families that have been torn apart by the most terrible circumstances yeah. as the Taliban has swept into power in Afghanistan. Yeah, and um, as the ACL, we will have our own um, sort of preferences or sensibilities about these issues. Uh, Many of our supporters have said, is there an attempt to prioritise Christians for repatriation, people who are native to that land but are Christian and therefore subject to uh, particular unpleasant attention from the Taliban? Is that all in mind? It is in mind, not just with uh, Christians but with our government because some of them are the most at risk. So we know that the government was able to give some visas to Bible translators because, again, some of those people would be the ones that would stand out for attention from the Taliban. And so our government Mm. is not necessarily looking at um, Christians so much as the ones that are most at risk, but often it is the Christians who are most at risk. Mm. Now, Wendy, it's not just this Afghan Pro Afghanistan repatriation program that we've been working on. We've also been talking to the government about those, as you were hinting at before, who have potentially uh, been in Australia for a long time, uh, but are looking at some some visa changes. Could you give us a, a bit of an insight into that whole long, long, long term asylum seeker uh, picture? Because I think a lot of folk just don't realise what remains to be completed in that work. And you know, it is really complicated. And there was a stage where the number of people coming to Australia by boat was just in the thousands. And and I know over a thousand people died at sea. So there was a need to do something. But this is quite a, this is a a real legacy that we have here of of the problem. Because what happened was that um, if you go back to when Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister, he ended offshore processing for refugees. And the result of was that tens of thousands of people flooded into Australia by boat from Indonesia. And they were actually um, enabled to do that by, um, by nefarious people, people smugglers, who exploited yes. them for their money um, and had no real care of them for their safety. And so these people um, fled, in, just poured in. And then um, in, in 2012, that was the real peak. Boat numbers just absolutely soared. And so when Julia Gillard became Prime Minister... Um, to address what was a, an unfolding tragedy, and everybody knew that it was a tragedy, she reinstated offshore processing. So then, but then on, it was on 19th of July 2013, Kevin Rudd was returned as Prime Minister, and he announced that asylum seekers who came here by boat without a visa will never settle in Australia. And so that statement was made. It was the decision was made retrospective to a degree, and the result is that we still now have. So that's 2013. We still have people here who, um, because of that cutoff, they are on some sort of a temporary protection visa. They are on some sort of visa that they will never settle in Australia, and yet they are genuine refugees. And so what that means is, in reality. For instance, during COVID, many of those people lost their jobs because they're working in restaurants or those sort of uh, hospitality positions. And when they lost their job, there was no job seeker. Okay, no job seeker. So churches, I just want to put a shout out there for churches in this because they just gathered around these people. And without the churches, many of these people would not have actually been able to survive because there was no money coming in for them. These people pay taxes. They Every time they buy anything at the supermarket, they're paying GST, for instance. But, for instance, another example is that their children, many of their children have now grown up here in Australia. Australia is the only country that they know. 
and they go to normal high schools with everybody else. But when it comes to university, unless they can afford to pay international student fees, they can't go to university. So there's a whole lot of things they have to reapply for for Medicare um, on an annual basis, many of them. They, have, they just have to continually reapply. It would seem as if the government has no, um, no thought of deporting them because they are genuine refugees, but neither have they got any hope of having a future here in Australia as an Australian citizen. They can't mm. buy houses or land, for instance. So we, we're just calling on the government. We believe that it's time... Um, it's it's very difficult to live without any hope. And this is now generational. So we've got the next generation. Some of them have been born here and they're, they're you know, in grade eight or nine. Some of them uh, were came here as a child and they now have this difficult future of not being able to even go to university. So <clears throat> we're asking the government and just grateful for... Uh, the support that we're getting from other organisations, but also from our own people, just to find a way not to not to change everything. <coughs> Sorry. Sure. We're just looking for a way not not to because we, we don't want the gates to open and people to start getting on boats again. But that that wasn't happening before the whole this whole scenario started. So back in John Howard days, for instance, that wasn't happening. Uh, so we just want, now that we've got control of our borders, we want these people to be given some sort of a visa that would allow them to know that they have permanency, that would allow them to get um, jobs, that would allow their children to go to university. And we believe there's ways to do that in a humane way, but also in a way that will keep our borders safe. And it's interesting, I think a lot of people don't realise, but folks that are on temporary protection visas that have been for a decade potentially, as you say, they've got children, they may have been born here, these are children well into their high school years perhaps now or on their way, uh, they're as Aussie as Vegemite, but when it comes time for them to go to, high, to uni, they won't be able to without paying international student fees, uh, they can't get Aus study, uh, as you said, no job keeper. So really these are... Uh, not a very large number of people, would that be fair? No, I think we're probably looking at perhaps a 1,000 people. It's not a large number of people. Um, right. so we... and, and is there a question too around how long the government should have to work out? Because I presume the government's argument is these people may be dangerous. We don't know who they are. We're struggling to identify them. We're struggling to give them security clearance. Is it that kind of concern? No, it's actually not, because these people are people who have already received genuine refugee status. So people who they're not sure of, they've already managed to move on. Often they choose to go home because they're not being given the t sort of protection that they want. So, you know, this, these people that we're talking about are genuine refugees. They want to actually support Australia. They want to participate in Australia. They want to do all they can to support this country. And, you know, at the moment we actually have a job crisis of getting people to work. We want these people to feel as if they are welcome here and, and warmly accepted into our society. Well, Wendy, that is a tremendous vision and it's a, it's a vision that's consistent with scripture that says to welcome the stranger. Um, that does not mean uh, no respect for one's own sovereign uh, borders as a, as a country. But when it comes to this unique group of people who are uh, in a very particular situation and they've, they've done the hard yards, they've done the decade or so, um, let's, uh, let's, let's keep fighting that fight. That's, a, that's an excellent battle on behalf of people who, who need someone to fight for them. Yeah. Look, as, as regards broad, more broadly uh, Australia's children, we've also been doing a lot of work uh, in the national, on the national education curriculum. Uh, this is Alan Tudge's portfolio as the National uh, Minister for Education. Um, we've been doing a lot of work there as ACL and we've had opportunity for supporters to get behind us in that. Uh, how is that progressing? So it's interesting because it's still, the jury's still out on that. Um, but there has to be something done. We've got the stats uh, and the well-known, uh, the latest results on Australian academic student achievement are showing a steady decline every year since the year 2000. 
Um, it's in reading, mathematics, and particularly science. And so we've, we've fallen from consistently being in the top group of nations to now being in the middle of the OECD pack. We have dropped from 4th to 16th in reading, 8th to 17th in science. We've dropped from 11th to 29th in maths. So um, UNICEF is wow. actually ranking Australia in 39 out of 41 high to middle income countries in achieving quality education. So we're, we're not doing well. And so um, what we're also seeing that there's a significant drop in the knowledge and understanding and the value. And I would also say the significance of democracy. So our understanding of just our very basic um, political principles here in our nation are just completely gone. And so we're saying we need a robust national curriculum. And with this, um, we're, we're, the review is still happening because Alan Tudge is not happy with what has been done. And so he's saying, no, we, this review is not good enough. We've got to go back to the drawing board. <clears throat> In that way, we asked, 13, we asked our ACL supporters to go out and, and speak to the education, particularly to the education curriculum. Over 13,000 of our supporters did that. And so, again, this is just so helpful because that's a, that's a big chunk of Australian parents who are saying to the government, we need to see changes in the national curriculum. And this is because we want to be able to compete on the world stage. Like, um, but, you know, yep. what we're doing here in Australia is instead of um, focusing on some of these key uh, educational important curriculum areas, we're bringing in all of this progressive ideology. We're flooding it with things that, are, you know, even talking about gender and all of this stuff at school. And so what happens is that some of these other areas of the curriculum get crowded out because there's just no time or room for them in the curriculum. So we're saying So Wendy, we, 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 indeed, and, and uh, I'm aware that in the US at the moment, it's a very kind of well understood story. Uh, critical race theory is a big battleground at the moment. Uh, YouTube's replete with videos of parents uh, at school board meetings protesting this, protesting that, uh, moving their kids into other schools or back into homeschool and so forth. But obviously that is not just a battle that's happening in the US, it's happening here as well. We don't particularly label these things critical race theory. It's, it's, it's more than that for us. But certainly uh, you have seen or we have seen that in the proposals for these new uh, curriculum models, uh, they are replete with issues of, of, of gender and wokeness, for want of a better way of putting it. Uh, and at the same time, it's, it's, it's great to see that Alan, Alan Tudge has stood back and said, um, we're not happy. I think um, just to explain to people watching what, what we're talking about here is because um, it seems like in this curriculum review, Anything about European settlement is always negative and destructive. So there's no acknowledgement of any positives. And it's been called by people who've looked at this curriculum review, they call it a black armband view of our history. And of course, of course, we need to acknowledge and even reconcile ourselves with some very dark chapters in our history. We, we all acknowledge that. But when you read the 84 pages of the draft history curriculum, there's not much good said about our country at all. Um, you know, figures like our, our longest serving Prime Minister, Robert Menzies, not even mentioned. Um, concerning even um, mentioned. English, they're even changing the name of English because they say that it asserts the besieged sovereignty of the colonial state. So we've got, it's, it's crazy. There's a total absence of Christianity, um, and particularly in the First Nations people, although, you know, the overwhelming number of Indigenous Australians actually identify more with Christianity than even their traditional Aboriginal culture. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a madness. Um, it, it, what it's doing is putting down Australia's Western cultural heritage. It calls it racist and discriminatory. Um, it's, not, it's not actually bringing... Um, healing it's actually causing division because it's a, it's division. sowing seeds of division um and it's simply illogical yeah 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 so that continues to be uh subject to review by the education minister uh we continue to be involved we're not the only group there are a number of other groups uh, uh busily involved unfortunately there are groups from all sides busily involved because again mm -hmm. you know as as you would know better than anybody wendy um, when it comes to children, there is no lack of energy to, uh, to get into their minds, to get into their emotions, to get into their hearts. 
uh, uh, for good and for bad. Absolutely. And so this is why we're so concerned about so many of these things. That's why we get concerned about the percentages of the kids on, on their devices and we know the dangers that are there. It's why we're concerned about um, the refugee kids who are not able to actually attend university. It's certainly why we're concerned about the education curriculum because what they're learning at school is actually forming the whole um, world view of what they're going to go out into the rest of their lives with. Absolutely. Well, more strength to your arm and to the rest of the team at uh, ACL who are doing that good work and uh, we'll continue to pray. And we always say this to our faithful supporters, but um, the only thing that could be more powerful than your activism, than your participation in petitions and campaigns uh, is your prayer. Uh, and we're very prayerful people here and we invite you to be as well. And we know that ultimately this is a battle not against uh, flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And we really do see it that way. And we really do encourage you to participate with us uh, in, in that way. Uh, as we bring this time to a close for this week, uh, we're very aware that uh, right now, in a way that we've never seen before, there is a tremendous, tremendous amount of activity going on all around the nation. Uh, preparing for the distribution of the Gospel of Luke. We've had 500,000 copies printed, and uh, I'm just showing you some of those images now. Uh, and we've also had uh, uh, those distributed all over Australia. So even as we speak right now, they're landing uh, in various uh, points for distribution. Uh, we have mobilised literally thousands of volunteers. I can't give you the exact number right now, but it's literally thousands of volunteers uh, are all around Australia to distribute those ahead of Christmas. Uh, we're in markets. Uh, we are letterboxing. Uh, we're getting very creative, but it's just in a wonderful opportunity after these crazy uh, 20, 22, 24 months, whatever it's been now of COVID, just to send out a very simple and a very powerful message of hope. Uh, so be encouraged by those images. And for those of you that are involved, we're so grateful to you. Uh, and we really look forward to what the next few weeks bring as we head into December. And, uh, and every one of those 500,000 copies uh, finds its way into letterboxes and into, directly into people's hands. And we've prayed over them. And, uh, and we're very, very excited. And I hope some of you will have a, an opportunity to receive a copy of those as well. Uh, Wendy, any final things that you'd like to add before we uh, close up for this week? No, look, I'm just really grateful to our supporters. I really am. It, so much encouragement comes from you. So thank you for that. And Alistair, it's just been great to be able to discuss these things. And I hope that they're help. I hope it's helpful for people to actually hear some of the more um, in-depth details of the sort of things that we're doing. Indeed. And uh, we'll be aiming to come to you every midweek, roughly Wednesday, uh, with about a half an hour's worth of an update as you've uh, had today. Uh, we'll introduce you as we go to the various state coordinators and directors who are responsible both for the political side of what we do and as well the mobilisation of volunteers. And there's a lot of overlap between that uh, as well, uh, of course. Uh, so between now and next week, uh, have a great week. God bless and good evening.